the always popular, gracefully succinct, except an Oscar approach. Or maybe just the elf. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> or perhaps I'm married to my all-time favorite, the Milton Burrow, who looked long and soulfully at his plaque, like I'm doing now. <laughs> then turned to his audience and with great emotion and sincerity said, of all the awards I've ever received, this is the most recent. <laughs> However, I've chosen a less popular long option, the Nobel Laureate speech. <laughs> this isn't the way it's usually done, I think, but I'm going to try to explain to you why you're giving me this award. <laughs> I'll do this by recounting some of what I can remember of the history of heritage and my part in it. Of course, I could do this blindfolded, but then it would be disordered to tell the Ferdinand slips. So I hope you'll forgive me for looking down at the paper here. Uh, President Obama would not give up his... Uh, his, uh, oh my. his teleprompter. Come on, I know how to run computers, I think. Um, so I'll have to read fast, so play pay attention. Uh, pretend it's a big, uh, bedtime story. Uh, I will get choked up three times in this rendition, so bear with me. Uh, that this history is a black hole was brought home to me by a phone conversation I had a while ago with one of you, a longtime state coordinator, in the course of which it became evident that he had no idea that I'd been the principal designer of heritage methods and systems. When I explained to him that I had personally designed mostly everything that the computer program, his response was, oh, I thought you had a staff for that. <laughs> At the time, I was thunderstruck, but I quickly reflected that it takes a life to lead a life, and nobody really knows what anybody else does. I left a pretty extensive written record, but who reads that? Besides, I hardly ever signed it. For instance, I wrote nearly the entirety of the Nation Service's first long-range plan, even the sections of finance, fundraising, and land protection techniques. And at all of the second, and the preponderance of the third, fourth, and I forget how many subsequent generations until the main outline became fixed and the uh, contents became uh, uh, conventional wisdom. I also wrote or co-wrote nearly all of the Conservancy's operating procedure manuals, all of the heritage manual, ironically. I didn't have time to develop the technology and document too. If something was standardized, I probably did. Hell, I even developed the format for the Conservancy's standard job description. <laughs> True. If you're wondering why such things were left to me, you have to understand when I started, the Conservancy was quite small, and everyone in it was totally wrapped up with land acquisition fundraising and deal making. Under the circumstances, I was obliged and enabled, it goes without saying, I was also inclined to think about everything else. The world of ideas, you might say, was left to me by default. Uh, thus, much of the modern nation conservancy and virtually everything about heritage first took shape on my whiteboard. My role in the conservancy was an interesting one, serving as a sort of a pope to the organization. Though my infallibility was not always recognized. <laughs> my secular powers were limited, but my spiritual powers were great. I couldn't usually order you to do anything, but it was my place to show that the righteous path was to behave in a certain way. <laughs> kind of like heritage programs after they spun off. So here's the story. In 1917, the Ecological Society of America established a special committee on the preservation of natural conditions. This committee split off in 1949 to become the Nation Conservancy. But before it did, in 1924, it published a book called The Naturalist Guide to the Americas. This was the first attempt to identify important natural areas for preservation. It isn't too clear what the Nation Conservancy was intended to do, except to somehow protect natural areas like those the guides had identified. It was some years before it undertook its first direct land acquisition, probably at Miami's River Gorge. The organization pretty much remained a committee of scientists until the early 60s, when a board faction obtained the Ford Foundation grant to make the organization more businesslike. After a while, however, a remaining board scientist, Dick Goodwin, obtained a grant to hire a staff scientist. That turned out to be me. By that summer of 1970, I completed my PhD on co-adaptation co of tropical fruit-eating birds and fruit-bearing plants, was, but was still at Harvard finishing up a postdoc as a demographic fellow of the Population Council and as EPG organizer. E.O. Wilson, one of my thesis, thesis advisors, proposed me for the TNC job before he even told me about it. 
I understand that I was ultimately chosen over several, several distinguished scientists and a university president, either because I was the only one who accepted the paltry salary, or because I was seen as green and malleable. <laughs> green I was. At that time, the Conservancy staff consisted of about 40 people, mostly at the headquarters in Arlington. It was a tiny western regional office in San Francisco and two or three people working in scattered locations around the country, notably John Humke in Illinois. Three more one-person regional offices were just being established. The president, Tom Richard, was a businessman and politician. The vice president, Ed Kingman, had been a former controller of the Navy. Pat Noonan had been hired as assistant director of operations six months earlier, and directors of development finance were hired a few months after I came aboard. Up to then, the organization had, in my view, made five significant inventions. Land acquisition itself, state membership chapters, local project committees, project revolving fund, and cooperative acquisition with government. No one was sure what to do with me. Tom Richards told me he wanted me to improve the quality of nature conservancy projects. However, he also told me that his philosophy was to grab anything they ain't making anymore. So I was a little mystified about what quality he might be referring to. I knew immediately that Richard's idea about grabbing anything was wrong. As long as you're stuck in a growing society, I realized, withdrawing a piece of land from the stream of development doesn't pre prevent the destruction that might have occurred there. It only deflects it on the other lands. Moreover, whatever you're trying to save, there must be a priority sequence among land areas, say 5% being most important. Random withdrawals, therefore, have a 95% chance of falling elsewhere on the importance spectrum. Thus, I reckon, whatever it was TNC was trying to save, the organization was instead increasing its peril. Unplanned development and unplanned <laughs> conservation go hand in hand. Before I'd reached any further conclusions, I talked to the guy who had just resigned from the job of corporate counsel. And he wasn't shy about expressing his low opinion of the organization. Wishing to think well of my new calling, I said to him, but still, they must be doing a lot of good. Maybe, he growled, but if so, it's an accident. Although I think he misplaced the blame, I gradually realized he was exactly correct. Given that the process for selecting projects, for selecting projects was somewhere between faulty and non-existent, and that none of the lands being acquired were actually designed for viability and defensibility, nor completed in any ecological sense, I realized we had no idea at all about what we were doing. So I began to think about what we should be trying to protect. We had proponents for everything from scenic landscapes to urban parks to hunting and fishing preserves to recreational open space and even for throwing in historic landscapes. The most prevalent idea was that natural areas were those that showed the fewest signs of human disturbance with some concept of an ecological climax as the dominant search image. Insofar as TNC was choosing projects other than opportunistically, they were repeatedly saving examples of whichever ecosystem types were least disturbed or most regenerated while ignoring damage remnants of the ecosystems that had been most impacted. Ergo, the organization was disparaged in the Northeast as the Gully and Hemlock Society, and in the Midwest as the Prairie Cemetery Lovers. <laughs> My family and I drove out to see the local preserves when we could find them. And I began trying to compile information on existing projects, something that hadn't been done. I discovered that the grab anything idea had been in full force, encountering several projects with no redeeming qualities that had been done just to show how land acquisition worked. <laughs> Parenthetically, I later conceived what became the Trade Lands Program as a way of putting such low quality real estate to better use. Pat Noonan and Ray Coulter later brought it to fruition. As projects were undertaken, undertaken so-called project packages were circulated all the department heads for review and approval. I had no yardsticks to measure the significance of any of them. Once someone circulated a proposal to acquire a so-called Agassiz Glacier, in the upper Midwest with the value of the project for trade in terms of the price of ice cubes by the bag. <laughs> I had become so immune to absurdities by that time I almost didn't get the joke. <laughs> I learned most of the above during my first month or two at TNC. At that point, I rejected the ideas of saving prettiness, open space, etc., and decided that in the, in the abstract, there were two worthy objectives for natural land conservation. You could either seek to preserve ecological function which I call carrying capacity, or you can try to preserve the full array of biological and ecological entities, which I call natural diversity. To have a meaningful impact on the first, I thought, would take an enormous effort beyond the reach of a tiny conservation organization. Therefore, it seemed to me that TNC should seek to provide ecological lifeboats to save biological species and communities from extinction. 
Thus, my first contribution to the Nature Conservancy was, was to invent what we now call biodiversity conservation. Of course, the details all remain to be worked out, and biodiversity has been a topic of academic research since Darwin, but I yield the palm to no one in the conservation context. Within a year or three, the logic and clarity of the argument persuaded the Nature Conservancy to adopt the preservation of natural diversity as its mission, the first institution on Earth to do so. Initially, we so completely owned the concept that when the word got around, we were approached by a then much larger conservation organization to ask whether, if they too adopted the biodiversity or the natural diversity objective, uh, we would regard it as an invasion of our turf. We uh, magnanimously gave them our permission. Not long after an immediate review of draft of the IUCN World Conservation Strategy, I criticized it as a formless mishmash and offered up my original diversity carrying capacity dichotomy as an organizing principle. When the final plan was published six months later, that's just how it had been reordered. The biodiversity conservation idea continued to catch fire. The idea of preserving diversity isn't the only view of the world I know. One story an outside review of the TNC science programs. One of the reviewers argued that we had it exactly wrong, that we should be concentrating on common species, not rare ones, because dominance are of greater ecological importance. How I didn't know this, I don't know. Uh, a few years before this, a famous ecologist said on the Nature Conservancy board, okay, Gene Odom, <laughs> opined that we should drop everything and devote ourselves to Greenbelt and the Sunbelt cities. I could further mention that we had another board member, Johnny Haynes, who strongly urged us to drop our science program altogether. <laughs> Stick to action, leave the thinking to the eyes of Walton Lake. At least the first two had a coach of thought. Apparently, they used ecology for further re engineering the planet. We haven't done such a great job so far. Instead of saving, uh, instead of saving and understanding it as it is. But to a guy who gave his eighth grade valedictory address on the looming threat of species extinctions, that would be me. <laughs> saving diversity made and still makes the most sense. With established objective of saving biodiversity, we still had no systematic process and lacked any kind of knowledge base from which to begin. I started by trying to get a handle and publish an ongoing natural area inventories. In the second long range plan, I included a list of these as potential guides for the project identification. It was all I could do at the time. I'd like to digress here and tell, I, I'm fond of digressions, those of you who know me, uh, know uh, life to me seems like a series of digressions. Uh, one consequence of doing that, I actually had three eureka moments in my years of conservancy. In the first of these, came from an interaction with the Western Regional Staff over that particular section of the Long Range Plan. That particular flash led to, eventually to the establishment of the Conservancy State Field Offices, the main engine of its latter rapid growth and prosperity. However, that story takes me away from the heritage narrative. My third such moment was about a way to undertake conservation internationally that was never implemented. The second I'll get to shortly. I soon began getting directly involved in inventories myself, most importantly with the IBP Conservation of Ecosystems Program. The International Biological Program was a big earth research initiative launched by the likes of ICSU and various academies of science. It mostly focused intensive ecological research on specific biomes, deciduous forest, conifer forest, grassland, but someone had thrown in a conservation inventory component, and then by the time I came on, a U.S. project to essentially update the National Sky was just getting underway. I became its most active committee member. The inventory concept hadn't advanced beyond the guide's original idea of consulting the experts, biology professors mainly, about what they thought the important natural areas were and why they were important. Nothing directly related to the biodiversity objective, but maybe a useful step along the way. Someone in England had developed a seven-page check sheet of information about a given natural area, its location, extent, contents, and perceived importance. We had a limited mailing budget, so I worked with Paul Lemon, a retired grassland ecologist and the only staff, to compress the check sheet. We developed a mailing list based on my source compendium and sent it out, anticipating a lot of what we, what we deludedly uh, called data coming in. I set myself the particular task of finding a way to computerize it. My experience with computers was very limited, and I was lucky to find Jim Mellon in charge of a new Honeywell mainframe at the Smithsonian. That big machine had less power than a modern cell phone, but it was a hot lick back then. <laughs>